Last video, I showed you how to set up Nginx, PHP, WPCLI, and MariaDB, which formed the foundations of our web server. In this chapter, I'm going to guide you through the process of deploying your first HTTPS-enabled site with HTTP2 support. HTTPS is a protocol for secure communication between a server and a client. It ensures that all of the data sent between devices is encrypted and that only the intended recipient can decrypt it. Without HTTPS, any data transmitted will be sent in plain text, allowing for anyone who's eavesdropping to be able to read the information. HTTPS is especially important on sites that process credit card information. Obviously, you want that data encrypted, but it's also gained widespread adoption for all sites over the last couple of years for two reasons. One is that Google has announced it as a ranking signal, so if you want to have good SEO, you need to have a secure website. But it's also gotten a lot easier and more affordable to install SSL certificates due to Let's Encrypt, which provides free SSL certificates. Now let's talk about HTTP2, which is the latest version of the HTTP protocol. It can provide a significant improvement to the load time of your sites. There's a complete article on HTTP2 on the Delicious Brands website, which explains in a lot more detail the benefits of using HTTP2. But just in short, all you need to know is that there's really no reason not to enable HTTP2, and the only requirement to use it is that the site must also be served over HTTPS, which we want to do anyways to appease our Google overlords and keep our users secure. Without further ado, let's go forward and obtain an SSL certificate. Now, I I do need to note that before you proceed, you need to make sure that you've added an A record to your DNS provider that points to your server. We did this in step one of this series, so if you haven't done that, go back and find out how to do it. All right, now let's get started. I'm gonna SSH into the server here. Great, I'm logged in. Now let's install CertBot. To do this, I'm going to head over to the written version of this guide and you can see there are four commands here. We're gonna go through one by one. And the first one is to install the software-properties-common, which is basically going to give you the ability to install additional software. You probably already have this running on your server, but if you don't, just go ahead and install it again. You can see here that it was already installed and nothing was upgraded or added in the process, but just go ahead and make sure you've got that installed. Next, we're gonna add the universe repository. This is from Ubuntu itself. Go ahead and copy this command and we'll paste it into the command line. Next, because we added a repository, we're gonna perform an update to make sure we have all of the latest packages. And finally, we're actually going to install certbot with the last command. Now to actually get an SSL certificate issued for your domain, you're gonna use the dash D flag. I wanna note here that you can actually use this for multiple domains. So if you're doing the www and the root version of your domain, you could have a separate dash D. In fact, you can get up to 100 domains issued in a single command line. For me, I'm just gonna to stick to a single one. So let me go ahead and copy this. I'll pull open my text editor here. I'll paste in the command, then I'll add the D flag and then add my domain name. Copy this, go back over to the terminal and paste it in. You're going to have to associate an email address with your SSL certificate. Go ahead and enter your email address. Agree to the terms of service. Next, you have the ability to opt into the EFF email list if you like. I've already done so, so I'm going to opt to answer no this time. And there we go. The SSL certificate is now being issued. Now, CertBot's gonna handle renewing your SSL certificate automatically, but if you want to test to make sure the automatic renewals are working correctly, there is a command for that. We're gonna jump back over to the written version of the guide again, and here is the command for that. We'll paste it in. It's performing a simulated renewal right now, and it looks like, congratulations, all of the renewals succeeded, so we are good to go. So there we go, we don't have to worry about our SSL certificate expiring and having to come back to a error message on our website. With SSL installed, the next thing we need to do is set up a server block so that Nginx knows how to deal with requests. Right now, Nginx will drop any connections it receives because in the last video, we created a catch-all server block. This makes sure that the server only handles traffic to domain names that you explicitly explicitly defined. Now, if you're not already there, make sure you navigate to your home directory. That would be cd tilde backslash. For simplicity's sake, all of the sites that you're going to host will be located in your home directory and will have the following structure. You can see we have the primary domain name here. There is a logs folder as well as a public folder. The logs directory is where the Nginx access and error logs are stored. The public directory is the site's root directory, which will be publicly accessible. 
Let's begin by creating the required directories and setting the correct permissions. I'm going to copy this command right here, which has a template version of what we need. Of course, I need to swap out this template with my own domain name. I'll copy it, open up my text editor, paste in the command here, and then let me enter in my own domain name. Back over to the terminal window, let's paste this in. There we go, this line right here added the two directories that I needed, and this line set the correct file permissions. With the directory structure in place, it's time to create the server block inside of Nginx. Let's navigate to the site's available directory. Type cd slash ect slash Nginx slash sites dash available. Now we need to create a new file to hold the configuration for this domain. Naming the file the same as the site's root directory will make the server management a lot easier when you add multiple domains to a single server. So I'll go ahead and type sudo nano pluto.daveswift.com. Of course, you'd want to replace my domain with your own domain there. This opens us up into a blank text editor if you see nothing that is correct. What we wanna do is actually head over to the written version of the guide and there is a configuration already in place here. Let's copy this, open up our text editor and paste in that configuration template. Now there is a little bit of modification we have to do and I wanna explain a few things here so you can understand my use case and see how it'll apply to yours and so you can get good results with how you're setting up your domains. Now the first thing is we've got this Ashley Rich domain that is used in the template and I need to replace that with my own and you should replace it with your own domain name. The easiest way to do this is with a search and replace. I'll go ahead and search for ashleyrich.com and let's replace it with my domain name which is pluto.daveswift.com. Now I'm using a subdomain here. We're going to talk a little bit more about that because you're probably not. You're probably using a root domain or a www domain. All right, let's go ahead and replace all these. Now, the next thing we need to do is update the username. You can see the access log has a file path right here, and it's got the username inside of it. My username isn't Ashley, it is Dave, so I'm going to go ahead and do another search and replace here. Great, so that's now updated. Now, just a little bit more on this configuration file. There's actually three server blocks. You can see we have one right here. If I go down a little bit, we have a second one, and at the bottom, we have a third. Now, Two of these server blocks are for port 443 or HTTPS. You can see it says SSL right here. So by default, the first one was going to be the root domain, or in this case, it would be something like daveswift.com. The second one is meant for the www version. Now, if you're using this on a subdomain like I am, I don't need this block so I can remove it completely. When I set up the SSL certificate, I didn't enable a www version. If you did, you'll want to leave this block, but for my use case, I'm going to remove it. In the third server block, you can see that it combines both the root or main subdomain like I'm using here, as well as the www version. Again, that's not applicable to me, so I can go ahead and just remove that domain name altogether. If you're using the www version, you're gonna wanna leave that extra domain there. This is only if you're in a situation like me where you're not. You can see that this server block is for port 80, which is gonna be the standard HTTP protocol. Now, why do we need to have that included in our configuration file? Well some people might just type it into their URL. So you want to make sure that that traffic gets then redirected over to the HTTPS traffic. So that is what this server block is doing for us. Let's go ahead and copy this, paste it into the nano editor, hit control X, Y to save and hit enter. So this configuration that we just added is a bare bones server block that informs Nginx to serve the domain over HTTPS. Additionally, any www requests will be redirected to the root domain. If there's any HTTP requests, they will be redirected to HTTPS. Now by default, Nginx won't load this configuration file. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Nginx file we created in a previous video. Go ahead and enter sudo nano slash etc slash nginx slash nginx.conf and hit return. I'm gonna press control W and search for virtual host. Here we can see that only files within the sites-enable directory are automatically loaded. This allows you to easily enable or disable sites by simply adding or removing the symlink. So what we need to do to enable the newly created site is symlink the file we just created to the enabled sites directory. Let's get out of the editor here and back over in the written version of this guide, I'm gonna copy in a command. I'm gonna bring it over into my text editor again. Once again, I need to add my own domain name here. 
And with those domains updated, we can now see that this command right here is going to link up the new configuration file, which is currently in the sites-available directory, to the configuration files in the sites-enabled directory, which would make our site accessible. Let's go ahead and copy this back over to our command line and paste this in. Now, in order for these changes to take effect, of course, we have to reload Nginx. And before doing so, we're going to follow some good behaviors here and test our configuration to make sure we didn't break anything in the process. We'll type sudo nginx-t, and the test is successful. So now we are free to restart. That is sudo service nginx reload. With Nginx configured to serve the new site, it is now time to create a database so that WordPress can be installed. Now, a couple notes here. When hosting multiple sites on a single server, it's good practice to create a separate user and database for each individual site. You should also lock down the user privileges so that the user only has access to the databases they require. Now remember, we're using MariaDB as our database, but the commands are exactly the same if we're using MySQL. Because of that, I'll be saying MariaDB and MySQL interchangeably throughout the remainder of this video. Now, let's go ahead and get logged into MySQL or MariaDB as the root user. We'll type in MySQL-U root-P. You will be prompted to enter your password, which we created when we were setting up MariaDB in a previous video. Now that we're logged in, we'll need to create a new database. Let's head over to the written version of the guide and grab this command right here. Then I'm gonna open up my text editor, paste this in, and of course I need to change the name of the database, which will be right here. That updated, I will copy and paste it back into the terminal window, and the database is created. Next, we need to create a new user, and to do that, we'll head back over to the written version of the guide. The command to do that is right here. I'm gonna copy that. Following the same practice as the previous commands, I'll open this up in a text editor, paste it in, and then we need to add our username as well as our password in here. The username can be anything you like. The password, again, should be secure. Go ahead and copy that, and then open up your terminal window and paste it in. Great, my new user has been created. Now we need to grant privileges. Now to keep things simple, you can grant all privileges, but restrict them to the database you created dedicated to this domain name. Here is the command in the written guide. I'll go ahead and copy this, paste it into my text editor. I want to update the name of the database to what I used in the first step when we created the database. And then of course, change the username to match what I just created as a username as well. Copy, head over to my terminal window, and paste it in, and we are good to go. Alternatively, you can have more granular control and explicitly define the privileges the user should have, and there is a command for this in the written version of the guide as well. But be careful not to overly restrict permissions because some plugins and major WordPress updates will require heightened MySQL privileges. If you want to know more about this, you can check out the MySQL privileges link in the written version of this guide. Now, so far, while using MariaDB slash MySQL, we have added a new database, added a new user, and changed the user's permissions. In order for these changes to take effect, we must flush the MySQL privileges. To do that, simply type flush privileges. And now we can exit MySQL. All right, now that we've got a new database set up, it's time to install WordPress. We can start by navigating to our site's public directory. To do this, we'll type in cd tilde slash domain name that you used when you set up your site slash public. Now we're gonna use WPCLI to download the latest stable version of WordPress into our working directory. To do this, simply type in WP core download. With WordPress installed, now we need to add the WP config file. Luckily, WP CLI has us covered here. There's actually a command over in the written version of the guide I'm gonna work from. So right here, I'm gonna grab this command, which will help us set up the WP config file. I'll paste this into my text editor here, and we're simply going to update some credentials here. So DB name equals Ashley underscore Rich. You're gonna to wanna to replace this with your database name that you created in MySQL just a moment ago. DB user, same same idea, you're gonna replace that with your username. And DB pass will be your password. Remember, you're gonna use the password for your database, which is not necessarily your root password to get into MySQL. I'll go ahead and copy this and paste it into the command line. There we go, it has now generated a php-config file for me. Now that we've got that in place, let's go ahead and install WordPress and set up the admin user in one fell swoop. 
there's a command we're gonna work from right over here in the guide. Let's copy this, paste it into our text editor. And again, we'll update the URL with our own. Title your website where it says title. Add your admin user, add your admin email, and create an administrator password. Again, you'll want to use something secure here, generate something from 1Password or whatever password manager you like to use. Copy this and paste it into the command line. All right, so we get the following message, sh colon one colon user slash sbin slash sendmail not found and success WordPress installed successfully. All right, so don't worry about the sendmail not found error. This occurs because we haven't set up email sending yet. We'll be doing that in video number five. But the good news is we should now be able to visit our domain name in our browser and be presented with a default WordPress installation. Let's check it out. There we go. We can see this is a normal looking default WordPress website. Cool. Additional sites can be added to your server using the same procedure that we just followed and you should be able to fire up new sites within a couple of minutes. Here's a quick breakdown of how to add additional sites. First, add the relevant DNS records to the domain. Second, obtain the SSL certificate. Third, navigate to your home directory and create the required directory structure for the new site. You'll need both logs and public folders. Fourth, navigate to the site's available directory within Nginx and copy an existing config file to use for your new server block. Ensure that you change the relevant directives. Five, symlink the config file to the site's enable directory to enable the site and restart Nginx. Six, add a new database and MariaDB user. Seven, navigate to the site's public directory and download download, configure, and install WordPress using WP CLI. You are free to add as many additional sites to your server as you like. The only limiting factors are the available system resources like CPU, memory, and disk space. There also might be bandwidth restrictions imposed by your VPS provider, but all of this can be overcome by just upgrading your package with the VPS provider. Caching will also greatly reduce system resource usage, which is why it's something I will guide you through setting up in the next video.